Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Yashai Sarid, author of The Memory Monster, originally published in 2017 and released here in the States in September in translation by Yardine Greenspan from Restless Books. Yashai is an Israeli author, novelist, and lawyer. His second book, Limassol, became an international bestseller. His fourth book, The Third, uh, the title is The Third, became a major subject of public and literary discussion in Israel and won the Bernstein Literary Award. So, the Holocaust. Do we need another book about the Holocaust? The answer is yes, this one. What is the reason? Well, as we know from the events in our, that are happening in the world as we speak today, and it definitely is today, we are heading down a road that lest we forget may cause another event that is as horrifying and as impossible to imagine as what happened to six million men, women, and children in the 30s and 40s. As the oldest of us die and the youngest of us remember little, we may begin to find ourselves just the seed of what sprouted almost a century ago as Hitler came to power. Perspective is what is wanted and needed, and perspective is what we get from this epistolary na narrative. A view from outside and outside of outside, uh, which allows us to reflect and to reimagine. So with that, welcome Yashai, and thanks for joining us today. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, so, as I said in the introduction, as I've read in some of the reviews, you know, and if you look at the Amazon top 100 books regarding them are about the Holocaust. So why is it that we needed another book about the Holocaust? And why did you want to be the one who wrote it? Um, for me and for many Israelis, uh, Holocaust is uh, very much um, uh, exists as a very important factor in our life until nowadays, both personally and collectively for Israeli society. Uh, it's something that we carry with us, the memory of the Holocaust, uh, all the time. And it's, uh, it's not just a distant memory, but it's something that influences our almost our daily, day-to-day -day life. What I describe in the book, the main scene is the book, is the scene of the Israeli youth delegations um, that go on journeys, uh, memory journeys to Poland. And that is something almost every uh, Israeli high school student um, uh, goes through. It's kind of a kind of a right passage, passage right for uh, for Israelis. And um, so it's something very, very much existent. And since it's very much alive in my uh, life and also as a family matter, maybe we could talk a little bit about it later. Um, I felt the, the need and the urge to, to write about it. Well, since you mentioned it, it does there, as I said, if someone was, say, 10 years old and in a camp just as he turned 10, he would be, what, um, 86, let's say 10, 45, uh, 56, 66, it'd be like 86 year olds old now, even if he's just 10. So as I said in the beginning, there's very few people still alive that can talk about it. And the young people are beginning to forget it, perhaps not in Israel, but in the rest of the world. And is that something that troubled you? And one of the reasons why you began this, especially when we get to the part where some people might not think it's as bad as what you do or what I do. Sure, you are absolutely correct because you see, even when people know about the Holocaust and study about it in schools, which is not everywhere, by the way, you see that the human lesson and the moral lesson of the Holocaust is is um, um, is almost forget forgotten nowadays. 
we see anti-Semitism rising, we saw fascism rising in all parts of the world, we see racism rising. So um, you understand that even when people and young people know something about the Holocaust, they don't understand uh, the lesson to our, our lives today. And that's, that's true also for Israel, you know, because Israelis tend to see the Holocaust in quite a narrow angle of uh, what it means for Jewish people and not seeing it in a wider perspective on what it means to humanity as a whole. Well, as late as yesterday, President Trump releases himself from the hospital and stands on essentially the same type of parapet as Mussolini did in the same way. And in Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, who I actually went to high school with, he was a senior and I was a freshman here in Philadelphia. Okay, uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And he was a very nice, very articulate, very yes. intelligent person, kind of in a way the exact opposite tr of Trump. But in my opinion, both seem to be, especially when Benjamin Netanyahu is, is thanking Trump, Trump for the peace accord um, so flatteringly. Uh, and those things bother me a great deal. Is that part of the lesson of this book? First of all, we have to be careful about comparisons, you know, because know. the Holocaust is not compared to anything else. But you're absolutely right. I saw the picture of your president standing on the balcony there of the, of the White House with all this, um, you know, light around him. It was troubling, let's say it like this, you know. And also, I'm not a great um, admirer or follower of our prime minister. But what we see is that the history of the Holocaust is used for political reasons. And I, uh, I refer to it political reasons and for political propaganda. For example, you see that in Israel, when you ask people, especially young people, who is responsible for the Holocaust? So almost all of them will know that the Germans, you know, are responsible for the Holocaust. But almost on the same level, they say, listen, but the Polish people are responsible uh, the same at the same level, or maybe even more than uh, carry more responsibility than the Germans. That's what you, you will hear from Israelis who study about the Holocaust at school. And that's, of course, a twist of history because most of the Polish people were no saints and many of them participated in programs and were collaborators of the Germans, etc., etc. But there is no comparison between the role of the Germans and the Polish people in the, in the war and in the Holocaust. The Germans were, were the initi initiators of the, of the Holocaust. They uh, built the, the concentration camps. They managed the concentration camps. So there is absolutely no comparison. And why is that being, why is, why is that the, the Israeli government or the Israeli leadership points a finger at the Polish people and not on the German people? Because Germany is a very good friend of Israel nowadays. And there is a lot of trade, there is a lot of cultural relations, which is a good thing, by the way, because we shouldn't, you know, be revengeful uh, for, for many years. But it's not uh, easy to put the blame on the Germans and to remember all the time to remind them of their blame. So it's much easier to put the blame on the Polish people. That's one aspect, one example of this thing. The other thing is that how it, uh, the Holocaust is being used and the memory is being used in our conflict with the Palestinians, with our neighbors, the people who live with us or near us, the Palestinians. And you see that motives that are taken of hatred, of uh, revenge, are taken from over there, from history, and turned against the Palestinians. So that, that's, that's one of the, the reasons why the, the book is called The Memory Monster, because the memory goes, it's, it's, it's not something frozen in time, but it's being manipulated. It goes on all kinds of strange ways that we cannot expect. And um, you are right that it's it's um, it's it's a dangerous time now because the survivors unfortunately um, uh, pass away. 
and soon we'll have no biological, we'll, ho- we'll have no real witnesses to the Holocaust. And that opens a whole range of possibility for manipulation, for twisting the history, etc., etc. And that puts a lot of burden and responsibility on our shoulders. And also on writers and artists. I think that art and, uh, and literature uh, have a very uh, important uh, responsibility and play to role and role to play in this uh, environment. Getting back to the book then, <clears throat> why one, is our narrator unnamed? And two, why did the book uh, take this epistolary form where it's one long letter to our protagonist's boss, employer, who he, he admires very much? Yeah, um, the book was written, I, I made very um, deep and wide research along the years. I read a lot, a lot of book about the, the Holocaust, both history books and the memoirs of survivors and their fiction and etc, etc. And then about, uh, it was five years ago, I went um, for this journey in Poland for two weeks almost two weeks. I took a car from Warsaw uh, Airport and went through all the death camps in uh, in Poland. Um, And um, uh, I was alone. I traveled and uh, I took some motel or hotel in the evening and went to and went to the next station. And it was really, really horrible, really terrible, really horrible. Although I knew everything, you know, almost everything by writing, I knew the whole theory, but seeing those terrible places in my own eyes was really devastating. And uh, I came back to Israel really almost shaken and uh, terrified by it, very much emotionally emotionally uh, influenced by it. And almost immediately I knew what I wanted, what, I want what in what fashion I want to deal with it uh, artistically, and I uh, sat and began to write uh, this novel, uh, and therefore why it was written, you know, like um, almost one passage long letter to the chairman of Yad Vashem, and very emotionally, as if I was the um, the protagonist, the writer of this letter because I felt very much attached to him, very much, I felt, you you know, in the evenings when I wrote the book, he and me were almost the same person. And that's also, I believe, why he doesn't have a name, because I spoke about myself, because I don't call myself Ishai, I don't call myself in my name. I felt uh, almost a complete, uh, there was no gap between us. We were the, the one person. Yes, but you're not the same person in the sense that, yes, initially he feels the horror and the terror of it, but he gradually insulates himself uh, in a very pragmatic and academic way from the actual things that occurred, which begin to lead to his downfall. And I doubt very seriously whether that that part is you. No, of course he's not, you know, this is not my my biography, it's not a real story, even though the historical facts are completely uh, correct. I was very careful. I I don't like fiction books about and fiction uh, movies about the Holocaust. I mean, we have six million true stories about the Holocaust, so we don't have to invent uh, new stories, uh, new Holocaust stories. So the fiction part of the book is what going on nowadays, the story of this tour guide um, and uh, what everything that surrounds him. But the, the historical story is absolutely correct. Now he goes in a process, he, he, he starts as somebody who knows almost everything about the extermination process, all the mere and small details of, about this horrible process. And the, that that what he lectures or guides to the youth or to, to the soldiers who go with him in those uh, journeys to Poland. But as time, and he's very successful in it. And uh, as time goes by, something is missing. Is um, He feels that he's too intellectual, too remote, 
and he feels that we don't do right to the um, uh, to the Jewish people who were murdered in to the victims who were murdered in the Holocaust to our grandparents, brothers, sisters, etc., etc. And he starts to look for their eyes and he tries to hear their voices and he wants to see them and to understand them like human beings and not like just a raw material in the killing process made by the Germans. And that's the main conflict he finds himself in, because of course he cannot see those people. They're, they're not with us anymore and he cannot hear their voices. So he tries to do it and he, he goes to this place in, a, in one of the camps where there are archaeological um, uh, excavations. And he's looking for traces of life or, you know, for uh, uh, keys they left behind, for old uh, photographs, etc., etc. But that's, that's the, the thing that haunts him. And he also cannot live anymore uh, with the, uh, you know, um, regular lessons or scripts given to him by Yad Vashem. Uh, that we have to be strong, that it will never happen again, etc., etc., which are, by the way, very important lessons for Jewish people after the Holocaust. I don't underestimate them at all. But he, underst he understands and feels that these cannot be the only lessons we derive, we learn from the Holocaust, that there should be also other lessons we learn. And he finds himself in a hard time delivering the other humane uh, uh, messages to, to the students and to the groups he guides. One of the sad parts of the book is because his description is somewhat clinical and he does know every aspect of it. One sad part is when he actually takes one of the survivors to the camps. Yeah. And his, that survivor's emotional state is so dire that he has to go home. And it's kind of he does understand that, but he also didn't understand it at the beginning. He thought he could just take them and he could then lecture the students as well. And then he realizes, no, he can't do that. And he lets him go home. And, sorry, but that's that's also indicative of the character's moral sense. You don't necessarily like him and he has some initial less than attractive qualities, but there is part of him that is attractive in the sense of his intelligence and his um, his what he feels is his duty to these children and youths. But um, do, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. He, he, he didn't want to, to go into this business. No. No, he wanted to be a diplomat, but he was in the in our foreign service, you know, in the, in the foreign office. He wanted to be a consul or ambassador or something like this, but he wasn't admitted to this program. So he said, I'm going to himself, I'm going to study uh, history at university. And he thought that he'll deal with something very remote and unemotional, like some, I don't know, ancient Far East history or something which has no direct relations to our lives nowadays. But then he's being told that if he wants to earn money from this uh, and have grants, etc., etc., the only thing that you can live um, as an academic in Israel uh, in the field of history is dealing with the Holocaust. And the chairman of Yad Vashem warns him. He told him, listen, you have to be very much emotionally stable in order to deal with it. Because you are dealing on an everyday, daily basis with the most terrifying horror in the history of the world. And on those uh, journeys to, to Poland, you actually revive in every journey, every day when you visit those terrible camps, the extermination process. You see the railway, um, where the railway arrived, and you see the barracks, and you see the remains of the gas chambers, etc., etc., which are until nowadays unimaginable, you know. Even though you know all the, that it happened, in, in, in fact, and you know, part of my family uh, uh, was murdered there, 
it's unbelievable that human beings made those and you see the names of the the victims and it's it's really hard to believe how human beings and how human race uh, came to it so that is also why it's not very much likable you know because in tra is trapped in this scene this is where he works this is his career and it it's very heavy on him that's why he collapses in the end and that's why I said at the introduction, as the cliche, if you don't remember the past, you're doomed to repeat it. And I see the beginnings of that, as I assume you do, and as our narrator does as well, in a different kind of way. But, and it's funny, some of the reviews, and I agree, it almost seems Kafkaesque, or perhaps more like a Nikolai Gogol, in that you keep expecting a turn towards magical realism. You keep expecting like the overcoat or the nose, one of those stories where something happens that couldn't possibly happen. And it, it never does, but it kind of feels like it, especially with his confession at the beginning that he was going to write just a letter, kind of apology. It was going to be straightforward. And then he says to him, he says to his uh, employer, no, I can't, you know, I'm just going to have to tell you everything from my own emotional standpoint. And that's yeah. where the comparison is apt. Yeah, um, yeah, there's something about it. And um, by the way, Kafka, in my mind, is much more realistic than we tend to uh, to relate to him, you know. Great. He was also a lawyer, by the way, as myself, you know. So I feel as a lawyer, I read his, uh, you know, the, the trial, the process, uh, in much different way than non-lawyers people, uh, because sometimes... Our legal work is so Kafkaesque, you know, that uh, it's really, it almost come realistic. And the, I think that the issue of um, living with the memory of the Holocaust, you see it in Israel, is, um, yeah, sometimes it's, it's real because it's such a heavy burden on our shoulders. I'll give you an example. You know, every year uh, there is the Holocaust Memorial Day in Israel. In 11 o'clock in the morning, there is the, this siren um, uh, going on and this uh, huge sound of siren and of alarm in all the streets, all of, all of the town, all of the villages in Israel. And everybody stands up. But what are you doing with little children, you know, kindergarten children? Which are three or four or five. How do you explain to them this siren going on? disturbing noise, what do you tell them? Do you tell them that, you know, our families, our uh, relatives were murdered, children were, uh, one and a half million children were murdered on those times, why are you doing it? So you have to, to go on with your life and build a nation and go with your ordinary life, always carry this terrible uh, memory, carry it on, it on your shoulder, and this guy, I put him, my, my uh, uh, the hero of the book, the narrator, I put him in, in the front of it because he, he cannot run away from the memory. He cannot, uh, you know, take vacation from it. He must be in it all the time. And that's why it, sometimes it's real because he's, he, he cannot go on with his life as usual anymore. Yeah, it's, it's interesting what you said earlier about the fictionalization. Um, not necessarily with Primo Levi or Eli Weissel, but but for example, I never liked the movie Life is Beautiful because yeah. it made it seem as if it was some type of fantasy camp. Um, and how could he hide his child? It is impossible. And and the, sa and the same is true in a sense of Schindler's List, and the same is true in a sense with all the different books about the diary of Anne Frank. And that's what I worry about is... Uh, as you said, when you're three or four or five, your title, The Memory Monster, is like, okay, a kid wakes up and yells, has a nightmare and says there's a monster in the closet or there's a monster under the bed. I think if that's the way it's told to children, I'm not sure that it's something that they can concretely visualize. I know it isn't. It, 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 it couldn't be. So I believe that's a problem. And I believe it's a problem. Yeah, but so that's why I think we have to bring it to our lives and to tell the lessons of the Holocaust 
in a way that not only the Holocaust will not happen again, but also lesser atrocities, you know, we don't have to reach the Holocaust again in order to fight those things. And the, the monster is very much around us because we see those atrocities not close to the Holocaust, you know, but we see racism, we see people uh, killing each other for uh, racism and for uh, fascism, etc., etc. And sometimes it seems that um, uh, the memory of the Holocaust is kept like a frozen article, you know, in a museum behind glass. You don't touch it. It's so sacred that you don't touch it and you don't talk about the uh, moral significance to our lives nice nowadays. And what I tried to do in this book and what my narrator tried uh, to do with not much success is to bring it to the lives um, of the, the youth, the, the young girls and the young boys uh, who go to Poland nowadays and tell them about nowadays, put them in the moral dilemmas that will not happen. You know, all of us think that if it happens again, we'll be righteous among the nations. You know, we'll save the poor people and we'll risk our lives, etc., etc. But then my narrator asks them very bluntly, those, uh, you know, pupils he guides. He tells them, what do you do if in the middle of the night a stranger, a boy, a teenager knocks on your door, you don't know him, and he's hungry, and he's dirty, and he's ill, but you don't know him, he's not a relative of yours, he's not from your color, he's not from your neighborhood, you have no connection to him, and he begs, please let me in, because otherwise I'll be killed. What do you do? Do you let him in? So some of the pupils raise their hands and say, yes, I will. But then he makes it harder for them and he asks them, and what, what do you do if you know that you'll be uh, killed for it? You'll be punished by capital punishment if you, if you help this boy. Would you do it? So nobody raises his, uh, his, head, his uh, hand again. So that's what you have to teach. You have to teach uh, people, and especially young people, moral courage and how to help each other, even if it uh, carries, uh, carries with it uh, some risk for you. It's very, very relevant for nowadays. Even when it was occurring in the 30s and 40s, Americans didn't disregard it, but just as German Jews must have said, this will blow over well with trump this will blow over he's just a blowhard how could anybody he'll be gone because because the jewish people were intelligent it made logical sense logic no longer controls and doesn't control in america now no one thinks about syrians or what china's doing in almost in a genocide way and you had charles Lindbergh filling halls discussing his views about it and um, ships being turned away um, all those things occur contemporaneously with the horror. And so that's why it's difficult to see. See, I, I do remember. I do remember because of my grandparents. And, yes. and so I do remember. But if you are living in North Dakota and North America with parents who emigrated from Sweden um, in 1910, it's really hard to imagine it. And that's why I think when he talks about those things, uh, about a boy at your door, or what would you do to an Ashkenazi Jew with a Jew that is not, doesn't hold the same views as you do? Or, um, yeah, what, as, we, as the children, the, the views of the children change, he begins to agree with some of the things that they believe in or apparently believe in. And I think that's the dichotomy between his knowledge of the Holocaust and the, the change that occurs in him during the book. Yeah, there's the issue, you know, we as Israelis as, and Jewish people have an issue with force because after what happened to us, after being helpless, after we weren't able to help, you know, our children and our wives or husband and uh, were murdered like, uh, you know, went to slaughter. Uh, so we don't want, of course, to be helpless again. 
But nowadays we are very strong. Israel is a very strong nation, you know. I served in the Israeli army for six years. I was an officer, so I know a little bit about it. We have all the most uh, sophisticated weapons, and we have a very trained army, and we are good soldiers, etc., etc. But then our psychology is still a psychology of um, very weak people, of haunted people, of uh, of um, uh, defenseless people. So that that makes it's it's hard because you, you cannot allow yourself to to uh, act responsibility morally in a responsible way like a strong person a really strong person you still think of yourself like very weak and uh, therefore we have an issue with force the whole issue is with force is is very problematic in Israel and it comes, you know, I, I don't stop myself in the book. So in, in one session in the one of the hotels in Poland, one of the boys says that in order to survive in this world, you have to be a little bit Nazi, you know, which is a terrible, terrible thing to, to say. But you hear it from people. You hear it from young people and also from other people. In order to survive in this world, you have to be ruthless. You, have, you need to be able to use force without any limits. You hear it everywhere, you know, and so th- that's, and that, that, that is a terrible thing, but it means that there is a monster. The memoir is a monster because if, it, if this is the lesson you take from the Holocaust, so you are in a very bad road. You, you missed your, um, you missed it. When I read the book, it reminded me of the movie Apocalypse Now when Marlon Brando at the very end discusses evil as being almost, well, he talks about how they went to the village and they inoculated all the children against polio. And then when they came back, the Viet Cong had cut off their arms of where the injection, the inoculation occurred and had stacked, much like the Nazis, just stacked the arms in a big pile. But what he said was there was just a a crystalline, diamond-like precision that he admired, and, 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 and just as the Israelis say, never again, and you are one of the most powerful armies in the world, second only to us, that, and there's, uh, there's speculation that you even have a doomsday device, so if things don't look good for you, you can just blow up the earth. Blow the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, and okay. I kind of, I kind of, even I kind of like that in a way. Um, so, yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's we, we laugh about it, you know, but it's one, part of the thing, you know, it won't happen again because we'll bomb you and, you know, it will. Uh, but it's interesting you uh, mentioned the um, uh, Apocalypse Now, which is, of course, based on the Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which is a great influence on me. You know, it's it's one of the best books ever in my uh, in my view. Likewise. And they, yeah, it's uh, of course you can find similarities because because when you deal with darkness, when you deal with violence, when you are ruthless, uh, you cannot uh, stay uh, uh, without any harm. The damage to your soul is being made. And um, as uh, Israelis, when we are dealing uh, with force so much, so there is a price for it. It's. Um and, and this I won't continue to beat a dead horse, but with regard to Marlon Brando's movie, he's of two minds as well, and that's why it ends with him saying the horror, the horror. Yeah. And that reminds me of the protagonist as well. Um, he separates the two things, and then not to do any spoilers of the book, well, I better not. Uh, I'll stay away from as the book progresses. But... Um, well, let's talk a little bit about, and we are here to sell the book and to a certain extent. If you don't mind, talk a little about, you, you started it. You talk, uh, uh, Suppose there's a different knock at the door and you're told, pack your possessions. Marry an investor. You pack your possessions and then you're taken away. Why don't you give a thumbnail sketch of what happens in that journey? Because our narrator does do that. Okay, so what I give in the book, and it was very important to me, even though it's not a long book, it's it's quite of short, it's quite a, a short novel. 
but uh, I tried to press into it as much facts about the Holocaust as I could because I saw also some kind of educational mission to it. And um, when you learn about uh, the Holocaust, the details of the Holocaust, the, it's, it's unbelievable because it was made by, you know, we tend to think about the Germans as a very sophisticated nation, etc. It wasn't sophisticated. It was, uh, people were Jews uh, who lived their ordinary life from the West, from, you know, as far as uh, Netherlands or uh, Belgium or uh, all other nations in the West, to the East, to Poland and the, the <laughs> Russia and the Soviet Union. And they just lived their ordinary lives, you know, with their families and jobs and the uh, love stories and uh, everything like, ordinary human beings and their culture and their synagogues and their concerts. And there were all kind of Jewish people, you know, from the most uh, religious, orthodox to the most secular, who almost didn't know they are Jewish. And all of them taken, you know, like a knock on the door, no knock on the door, go away, you know, we are taking you to the East. We are taking you right away with your children, packed on those trains who were meant uh, originally for uh, on terrible, terrible conditions and taken to the east, a distance of hundreds of thousands or thousands of uh, miles uh, far away. And uh, in, the, in the end, after much torture and misery uh, brought to those extermination camps and being gassed or shot uh, by the Germans and their collaborators. And, um, you know, that's what, what happens to my narrator that it, he starts, the, the, there's a problem with the number. The number six million is too terrifying to deal with the details. But you have to think about one person, one father, man, one mother, one child, going through this uh, horror and um, it breaks your heart. And as you go older, at least for myself, as I went older, because I was in Poland also in one of the journeys when I was very young, when I was 17. And it was much, much harder now when I have a family and you think about imagining what happened there and being so helpless and unable to, you know, to do the most um, natural thing, which is to take care and help and protect your children. And that's unbearable. Talk a little bit about, if, talk a little bit about, because people, Many people don't know this. The difference where Treblinka was a death camp and Auschwitz was a labor camp. So in Treblinka, there was yeah. not even a selection process. There were all over Europe. There were hundreds, many hundreds, maybe thousands of concentration camps in which the Germans and their collaborators all over the place uh, imprisoned the um, uh, people both Jewish and non-Jewish, like also political prisoners and the Soviet uh, prisoners of war, et cetera, et cetera, in terrible, terrible uh, conditions and actually enslaved them uh, until death and many millions um, died in those camps. But they also operated much fewer camps, which were um, intended uh, for the sole purpose, no work, no enslavement, just for the extermination of Jewish people. And these camps were all were kept almost exclusively for uh, Jewish people. Um, Sobibor, Treblinka, uh, Belgets, Chelmno. And Auschwitz was kind of a mix of them. Auschwitz was, which was of course the, uh, the biggest uh, camp, um, was a mix of extermination camp and a uh, labor camp. Uh, whenever people came to uh, what was called the selection, uh, they were brought down from the from the trains, were uh, hit by uh, whips and uh, bitten by uh, dogs, etc., etc. Go f faster, faster, faster. And then there was a selection between about 70% of the people, older people, children, uh, weaker people, ill people, all in all about 70% uh, from each transport 
was sent immediately to the gas chambers. Um, and they were exterminated the same day, a few hours after they, uh, they arrived. Uh, and then burnt, the, their bodies were burned uh, in the crematorium. And about 30% of the, each transport uh, was sent to um, uh, slave labor in the different uh, factories uh, the Germans uh, built uh, around the, around Auschwitz, and almost, almost, uh, also almost a huge percentage, almost also of those uh, uh, labor slaves were uh, also uh, dead, killed uh, after a few weeks, or after a month or two or three, because they were starved and uh, treated very, very brutally and from the, the extreme uh, cold of uh, Northern Europe in winter. So all in all, almost everybody that uh, died in those camps, but there's the difference between Auschwitz, which was used also for those, for this uh, forced labor, and uh, for Treblinka, in which uh, the, um, all of the people on the same day uh, came to the place by train and were murdered on the same day. Um, uh, part of the places you still have the remainders, um, uh, the, the signs of the, the original camps, like in like in Majdanek, uh, but in other places, the Germans, when they already knew they are going to be defeated, um, uh, destroyed the uh, destroyed the camps in order to uh, not to leave evidence uh, uh, behind them. There is. Uh Another portion that many don't understand and immediately condemn, and that's when you talk a little bit about when your protagonist talks a little bit about the Sonder commandos and how they could have done what they did. And there is some ambivalence there as well. Yeah, Sonder commandos were the Jewish people who were forced by the Germans uh, to work and to um, operate the extermination process. They were the ones who um, uh, took away, carried the, the bodies of the um, uh, victims after were, they were gas, uh, killed by gas in the gas chambers. They took them to the crematoriums. Uh, they were the ones uh, to do all the dirty work uh, over there. They were the ones who um, uh, shaved women's heads and uh, took the um, uh, gold or silver from the tooth of the victims, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all those horrible things, and the most of them were Jewish people who were forced by the Germans to do it. The most terrible job you can think about in the world. Nobody, of, none of them wanted to do it, but they were able by um, by uh, doing it to buy them some time, you know, and uh, they wanted to live, so they, they really had no choice. Some of them committed suicide in order not to do it, but most of them, without any other choice, had to do it. We're talking about a few hundreds in every such camp, in Treblinka, a few hundreds, in uh, Auschwitz, a few hundreds, and they were also replaced from time to time they were ex executed by the Germans and a new, uh, new people uh, took their place uh, and so on. And there is a, um, a, there is a book of uh, interviews um, um, done by uh, an Israeli scholar a few years ago with the survivors, few survivors of those Zonder commandos, and they portray the um, this terrible work they, they were forced to do. And um, but on the same time, you know, it was the, the it's it was like living in hell, worse than hell. But it was still living. And there was those strange and terrible uh, relationship um, um, being made between them and between the Germans and how they survived theirs and how they took the, the food the victims brought uh, with them and then um, the, the whole thing but we know it's not only the Zonder commandos the the Germans uh, evil plan was to uh, use the the Jewish people against themselves you see it also in the Juden rats Juden rats were the so-called kind of a self uh, rule of, of self regime of the uh, Jewish people in the ghettos which the Germans uh, 
uh, fenced or built. And of course, it was not self-rule. They had no autonomy, but it was used um, uh, against the Jewish people in order that those Judenrats uh, will help the Germans in organizing the Jewish uh, people to their death in order to avoid revolt, to avoid the mutiny, and to make the German's life uh, easier. And that is, of course, you know, it's not, you cannot judge any of it because there were, Jewish people were really helpless, you know, they had no army, they had no strength, they had no force, they were not organized, there was, they were not trained as soldiers, so they had no much choice, but still, um, it's 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 a very bad memory, and you know, in the first uh, years of the state of Israel, state of Israel was born in 1948, was established, gained its independence in 1948, and in the first years, the Jewish people already living in Israel who didn't went who didn't go through the Holocaust, who were raised here in uh, in Israel as uh, you know as strong and the independent people looked at the survivors as some kind of, um, in some kind of disgust or a moral, put the moral blame on them. Why didn't you revolt? Why didn't you protect yourself? Why did you collaborate? Which is of course wrong because they didn't understand it. Uh, and the only thing that was significant was examples like the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which was, was an amazing thing, you know, it was uh, almost the only place in Europe when very few people, helpless, starved, etc., took arms, very few arms, and went against the whole German uh, division and kept them for a few weeks in, uh, in uh, not conquering uh, the ghetto, which is, of course, uh, an example for uh, courage and uh, bravery. But as years went by, people here understood that the real bravery was of the mother taking care of her children in the most, in the hardest uh, uh, circumstances. And of the teacher who went on teaching uh, his uh, class, even though the whole world collapsed outside. So we, we had to look into the, the more subtle and the um, uh, uh, smaller examples of courage, not only of uh, military courage. One of the, the books I think that explains that question about why didn't they do anything, why didn't they revolt, is that book Bottom ha Bottomheim 1939, uh, which kind of says, you know, that they're told the sanitation department becomes the Nazis and they're gradually told what's going on, but they're having their annual orchestra festival and they just, yeah. and that's almost magical realism. They did. And, but then I thought, well, is that really what happened? Did they just not know? And they thought they were going to some vacation camp or billboards that says, come and see, uh, come here and see what we have, you know, that kind of thing. There was a very much intended, the intensive uh, deceit effort by the Germans until the end. When the, for example, in Treblinka, when the uh, transport came there, there were signs in uh, German and also in other lang languages as if they are t uh, being taken to the real showers, to a bath, you know, and they uh, portrayed it like it's an ordinary uh, train station. Everything seemed normal until there was no choice, nowhere to run away. And then, you know, reality was until the doors were closed in the gas chambers and then the people realized they were the seat. Now, many of them already knew, you know, in Warsaw in 1942, you already knew the Jewish people are not taking to showers, but to extermination. But human nature cannot, you know, the person does not want to, to believe in such horror. And he wants to, to cling to, to stick to any belief in uh, or to any hope, uh, saying that he will be able to go on with his living. Maybe they are not killing us. Maybe they are taking us to really taking us to a place where we will be able to work somewhere in the East. So people didn't want to understand it, didn't want to grasp it. And even if they did, what could, what could they do against the great German huge German military machine. They had no weapons, they had nothing, you know. So what, what could they do? It's, um, I know 
it's not correct to compare anything that's happening now to what happened then because it's just too far apart, the horror. But in America and in the world today with COVID, for example, there are people that deny deny that it's anything. They deny that it's anything more than the flu. And, and those things bother me. They really do bother me. The polarization, uh, the fact that masks have become a political statement, those types of things. As I said at the beginning, it is a slippery slope. And I'm not saying it's going to end in the same way, but I am saying that some of the there are similarities. You may disagree with me, but I believe there I think, are. I think that ordinary people, normal people, uh, peace loving people have very much very hard time um, uh, encountering evil or encountering evil people or evil leaders, evil leaders, because most of us are not. We don't want trouble. We don't want to go to jail. We don't want to uh, protest and find ourselves in some uh, prison uh, cell, even for one day, you know. We don't want to be involved in violence. So that's exactly what tyrants and dictators and the uh, psychopathic leaders take advantage of because they are not uh, made of the same human fabric. They are different. They are cruel and they are evil and they are um, uh, they have no limits. They have no moral obligations and they uh, and th that's how it's because most of most of humanity is really peace loving. Most of people don't want to kill each other. I really believe in it. But the 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 evil genius of those kind of leaders is being able to uh, incite one group of the population against the other and incite for violence and the rise and misuse the hatred the, the all the uh, the natural feelings all of us have of uh, being afraid and being hateful sometimes but elevating it to such a, an extent that we turn against each other and become monsters ourselves that's why, for many reasons, I admire Einstein, but I also admire him because at the time he goes, no, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> this does not seem good to me. You know, I'm, I'm getting out of here I, before something terrible happens. Yeah, but Einstein was already Einstein. He was very famous all, all over the world. And most of Jewish people in this period, also, even if they wanted to flee away, they couldn't do it because nobody took them in. Uh, so, you know, for Einstein, it was very easy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, many, and today, it's, for many people, it's easy to insulate themselves from the things that are happening in the world, especially if they're, today you would call them influencers, which is a silly term, but it's very important in America. Yeah, and, uh, of, and of course, also, in, in you know, in Germany of the 1930s, you could live your life, you could live very nice life, with your family and uh, you know uh, put uh, your your hands on your ears and uh, on your eyes and don't see and don't hear anything you know what do i care for those jewish people yeah. i don't know any yeah it's not my problem or feel sorry for them you know you could only you can also feel sorry for them and say it's not proper what they are doing to them but not lift your finger and uh, let the nazis what do what they want so in that sense, you're also a collaborator when when uh, when you ignore it, and that is part of the criticism I um, I tend also uh, towards us, towards Israelis, towards Israeli society nowadays. Uh, I think we should be better than other nations. We have a more responsibility to uh, to help each others, to help others. Uh, more than other uh, nations have. We don't. I don't want to be like all those nations who didn't let the Jewish people in when they needed the refuge. Okay. Well, let me ask a concluding question then. And there doesn't have to be a real answer to it. But in writing this book, was there any type of agenda that you had that that the book could accomplish to forestall anything that was happening in the world today? Was there a purpose to the book? other than the fact that it was a good book? Um, I don't think that books uh, influence directly and immediately the behavior of people or politics. I don't, I don't think it, it, uh, it goes like this, but I, I think books have an influence, may have an influence uh, on the long run. 
my, my first uh, motive in writing a book is the story. That's right. the most important thing. It has to be a real story. The, the characters should be real. The emotions should be there. The voice of the um, uh, protagonist of, or the narrator should be heard very um, um, uh, in the right way. Um, so I have no direct, you know, I have no uh, ambition to change the world with my books. It's enough for me that people will read them and maybe think about the, th the issues I raised there. And um, but I think that that art in general and literature is very, very important in our days because of all the complexities, because of all the noise that is surrounding us. So literature is an island. Good literature is an island of uh, of wisdom and of uh, humanity. Well, thank you so much. And also, I own an independent bookstore. So the best I can do for the world is to put your book on the front table, which I will do. Thank you very much. And hopefully it'll be a book that we discuss in one of our book clubs as well. Thank you. I'm sorry I cannot come and visit you nowadays, but maybe I know. someday. Yeah. Well, when you when you can, I'm just outside of Philadelphia and I would love to meet you. Um, sure. Thank, thank you too. so much. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.